science as a method, as opposed to science as an institution, the particular people who happen to be running the scientific enterprise at any one time. But the standards of science, in a sense, you can't argue against them because the only way that you could show any of the limitations of the claims to knowledge from science are with better science. It's like criticizing rationality. There's something inherently incoherent about it because it's only by developing a more sophisticated rationality that you could criticize the rationality that's in effect at a given time. I think, I think Brian was frank the other day on, in a panel when he said that you, what you're actually trying to do, and I know this was loose, is to try to accumulate evidence to distinguish this just-so story from that just-so story, which acknowledges that science begins, as, it, as we all have always talked about, as, as storytelling. You have to tell some sort of a story to begin with, and then you test it against reality. But That's right, but the one thing that I would emphasize is if we were better at communicating the larger framework within which science happens, which is it's almost unheard of for a new result to overthrow the past, simply yeah. wipe it out and we're on to something Never. that completely erases everything that came before. Usually, almost always, it's incremental shifts in our understanding. We understand a domain a little bit better, we can extend our ideas a little bit further. And indeed, at the cutting edge, those extensions often will later be shown to be wrong or need to be modified, but the core of the enterprise almost never is thrown away, is never wiped out. And that's the bit that gets lost when we still, when we always think, oh, new result says this, new result says that, and we feel that everything is changing. No, no, the core is not changing, it's just at the edge. And I take, I get rid of the word almost. I mean, the, the, those, the great thing about science, and it's the biggest misunderstanding of science, is that scientific revolutions do away with everything that went before. Yeah. That which has satisfied the test of experiment is, no, is not false once you <laughs> discover new things. And that's, that's a huge public misunderstanding. But I want to jump on something you said that I think is really worrisome. <laughs> and that is stories. The public has this perception that science is a set of stories, and religion is a set of stories, and it's these stories versus these stories. But science is a lot more than stories. If it were just stories, it, it wouldn't be worth talking about. It's stories that make predictions. <laughs> and it, it's a view that makes predictions about things that can be then tested. And that's the whole point. It's, and I really do think that a lot of the public's perception or an unwillingness to, to sort of accept things is the perception that it's just a set of stories and that you can choose which ones you like best. No, I'd already contexted that yeah. with Popper's yeah. discussion. No, I know. I wasn't it's, it's fine for you to make the point more, yeah. more strong. I think there's a problem also with trotting out Popper all the time because oh, okay. there's, a, there's, a, yes. there's a, a, a yeah. real sense in which there's a, there's a double standard whereby science is held to the sort of standards of Popper. You never actually prove anything. You only fail to, yeah. to disprove it. I mean, technically, that applies to everything. That applies to the fact that this table is sitting here and that it's sunny outside. Right. I mean, these are just hypotheses that have never been falsified. <laughs> but only science has to suffer this heckle um, mm. of, of, of the, the Popperian standard. And the, the, the public misunderstands this. You know, evolution is only a theory. Well, yes, but it's only a theory that we're sitting on chairs. Um, in, in, in that sense, in the same sense as it's a fact that we're sitting on chairs, mm. it's also right. a fact that evolution is true. Because right to the idea of science is an accumulating, self-adjusting knowledge, which it is, uh, and today, you know, every time you get an airplane or you use your mobile phone or something, via its applications through technology, it's being constantly confirmed, and it's getting a lot of supporting uh, um, data there. But, but in addition to that, in describing what it is, one wants to say something about it as an attitude, that, that, that science is, is, a, is a way of doing things, a way of thinking and of finding out and of testing it. It's a, and it, it, there's a very marked contrast between a, a, the scientific mindset, which is prepared not to know things yet, prepared not to understand things yet, prepared to be open-minded, prepared to, to uh, recognize that solving a problem may very well generate a number of new problems, and to be interested and excited by that to be interested and excited by uncertainty and open-endedness. Whereas there's another kind of mindset which wants a neat story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, it wants closure, wants everything explained. This is characteristic of the religious mindset. And it's very uncomfortable with open-endedness and uncertainty, and not, not wanting to know. And there's a huge contrast between the fact that you can tell a, a closed, neat story which has got a beginning, middle, and end, and a meaning in 10 minutes, and you can't do that with science. It takes you know, a, a certain apprenticeship to be able to get in there and, uh, and to be a con net contributor to the scientific process. That's not the same thing as saying that it, it's hard to become scientifically literate, because this is the point we were talking about earlier, that we want to encourage people to be scientifically literate. But to understand that, that this open-endedness, this uncertainty, the fact that not all the answers are in, that, that, that some answers create more questions, all that kind of thing, 
It's an excuse which is used by the people who like the, who like the neat closure type story to say, well, you don't know the answers, and there is uncertainty. We don't know how it began, we don't know where it's going, and to use that as an excuse for, for stopping thinking about it. But to come back to what Brian said, I think that meshes really ni nicely to his initial statement that, that the problem is some, somehow what we teach. It's, it's a lot e it's, that's a really difficult thing to teach, and, and, and it's a lot easier to teach a set of things you can test and moreover, I think, in addition to what you said, the problem is that the people who are doing the teaching are not necessarily comfortable with the science. And if you're not comfortable, if you haven't participated in the process and are not comfortable with it, it's very difficult to talk yeah. about it. And most, a great majority of the middle school science teachers in this country really have never taken, there's statistics, have never, have never taken science beyond high school. And, uh, and it, it, I think there's a real, therefore we have a real problem because we get people to teach these set of facts and not the process, which is probably the most useful thing that kids can come out of school with. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's really a, a, a problem. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. I agree with those points. But there is still, the reason I made them is that there is this, in my experience anyway, this public perception of, of, of a need for certitude. Yes, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with um, this recent uh, uh, stock market crisis. I mean, c decisions made under conditions of uncertainty the neuroscience of all of that, if, if the people had understood more of the neuroeconomics of all of this sort of stuff, perhaps it wouldn't have gone in this direction. I have no idea. But, but let me go back to a point that, that um, I think Brian made earlier, which is the, or maybe it was Richard, the, the, the fact that there's no overnight revolutions. Um, what was it, 14 April 1953, the Crick and Watson paper was published on the DNA, the structure of, uh, the structure of DNA. There were virtually no citations of that paper no increase in the number of scientists, uh, apart from the fact that it wasn't refereed, remember, because the, 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 the enterprise of science at that point did not even have referees for journals, so it just got in because the editor thought it was a good paper. Especially in Nature. You know how right. the, the editor of Nature worked then? It was John Maddox, was it? No, but before, before, before John, John Maddox. Maddox yeah. He took a briefcase full of papers to the Athenaeum Club in London, <laughs> where all the members were sitting back in their armchairs <laughs> after lunch, snoozing, handing out papers and then he would come back at tea time and pick them all up again, they having been refereed. That <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's, it's, things have changed slightly. Yeah. Um, I think. There are two points in here. One point is that the, the, crick, uh, uh, the DNA paper, the classic paper, itself did not start being cited in, in large numbers until roughly 1990, when the Human Genome Project got into gear. In other words, when the technologization of it all started that, happening. That well, that's, but that's right. not so surprising. Yeah, we uh, talked about it, I mean, great, uh, really important advances aren't I, obvious I, at the time, mm -hmm. uh, all the time. I mean, we, we've had, we, we had... There's a massive, there's a, well, there's a spike. But we had, you know, at this meeting, Steve Weinberg here, you know, won the Nobel Prize for the Standard Model, and his paper wasn't cited uh, at all. Uh, for years afterwards, yeah. and, and I think it happens in every one of our well, fields. The Darwin, well, Darwin, Darwin Wallace paper you, was, was you completely ignored that. in 1858. Yes, um, it's I part mean, of it also that, that uh, science doesn't work from canonical texts, and the actual paper is not that big a deal compared to the idea that once an idea becomes so obviously mm -hmm. true that it becomes second nature, you don't need to cite the original source. If I cite the yeah. inver if I mention the inverse square law, I don't need to have a footnote attributing mm -hmm. it to... Yeah, yeah exactly. To, once to it's Newton, important, yeah. it's... it's it's, it's and background. I think with Watson and Crick, I mean, I don't know how many people ha felt a need to cite that paper once it just became the indispensable infrastructure yeah. of biology. I think the point was that it still took a while, as as with the with the reading at the Linnaean Society of the Darwin and Wallace papers, for it even to penetrate what was going on. I think it can uh, happen both ways. I mean, there's certainly a, I'm aware of papers that really changed people's thinking fairly significantly in terms of what they were going to work on. That paper came out, and they just changed their research yeah. and focused upon it. Again, it didn't wipe out the core of the science that went before. It just had enough of a compelling story to, be, to tell. <coughs> Matt, you don't like that word. No, no, no. It, had, I like a, the, yeah. it had, had enough of a new direction that people said, this is something I really want to work on. They'd shift immediately. And yes, as you say, there are other examples where you know, technology needs to catch up before you can really make yeah. use of it. And that's but, a, but I think the bottom line is the core is stable. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but but we, you know, the, all of us have been, we all.